Eh, invito eh, il professor John, eh, John, Gordon, John Gordon a salire per la sua presentazione. Eh, please, professor Gordon, Nobel laureate, he will speak about, um, about uh, reprogram, uh, reprogramming genome. If I speak like this, okay, can you hear? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether anyone else can. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I hope that if I speak like this, you can hear what I say. Is that likely to be right? Can I, can I be heard? No. Right? Have to sit down. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You, and then you want it like this. Is that better? <laughs> um, I am told I have to be sitting down so that you can hear what I say. Well. <laughs> so I will speak like this and hope that you can hear what I say. I'm very grateful to be invited to visit this city again. When I first came here many years ago, I visited the Stazione Zoologica, a famous place in Naples, and this was where many of the best-known Italian uh, scientists were working. In particular, Alberto Monroy was one such person, and he uh, had a very distinguished career and worked in Naples. So now, let's see if we can make this work. Oh, there we are. Get back to the beginning of the presentation again, if I can. Right, this is my uh, first slide, and I would like to start by remembering the uh, phenomenon which first interested me in biology. This was the uh, and I, I should say that during this talk I will cover three things. Reprogramming of differentiated cells, mechanism of reprogramming, and the prospects for cell replacement. When I was young, I was impressed by the uh, phenomenon that we call frog spawn. Uh, these are the eggs or embryos or frogs which live in a pond. You see them on the left hand side and in a short while they turn into tadpoles and swim away. Very soon after they are formed these eggs rotate and they all face the same way up. And after a short while, uh, they, you see them swimming around uh, like that. Now, the question which I asked was, how do these eggs know how to turn into a tadpole? The mother which made the eggs has gone. So the eggs are not trained or taught 
how to develop into embryos and then into tadpoles. So it's a very remarkable process by which the egg somehow knows how to turn itself into a swimming uh, organism. The same phenomenon is true in mammals, but the question is not so simple. In the case of the frog eggs, they are isolated, they live in the pond, and somehow they know how to turn into a living organism. The same question arises for human development. In the old days, they used to think that the eggs had a miniature organism inside them. So if you looked inside the egg, you would find a small copy of either an animal or a tadpole or, in the case of mammals, a human. But if you look inside this egg, there is no such thing. There is no miniature organism. Somehow this mass of substance knows how to turn itself into a living organism. And that is a, a very remarkable phenomenon. We now know that there are two fundamental concepts of how a fertilized egg makes an embryo. And this diagram shows the way this is thought to happen. This can show or not. Uh, on the left, you see a diagram of an egg, and all eggs have different substances <coughs> at one end compared to the other. This one is shown with yellow substances at one end and blue at the other. And this in the next diagram to the left, called embryo, the material on the left goes into cells which have this yellow substance, and the cells taken from the other end take up the blue substance. So already at the beginning, some of the cells of the embryo are different from those at the other end. And this process is called asymmetric distribution of determinants. These substances are colored so you can see them, but that is the first difference that happens, and this means that when the egg is formed, there are differences between one end of the egg and the other. The second fundamental process is called signaling between cells. That's the middle diagram. And it shows that the cells with the blue substance send a signal to cells with the yellow substance and make some of the yellow cells become different, shown as green material. And so this second process is called signaling, and that is fundamental to all cell processes in animal development. And so you see, on the right-hand side, you now have three kinds of cells. They call them ectoderm, which make brain and skin, mesoderm, which make muscle, and endoderm, which make intestine. And this is the fundamental process by which these differences between the cells first take place in development. After that, the signaling process continues and many more kinds of cells are formed, eventually about 200. And this is the mechanism by which the egg turns itself into a living organism. <clears throat> so now I talk a little bit about the 
background to this field and we now want to know how does this work? What makes the cells that start being different from each other actually turn into functional cells such as heart, brain and so on? And so the next few comments will concern background. We have to remember that the original question in the 1950s asked whether all cells of the body have the same genes. That's uh, 50, 60 years ago. We did not know that. We did not know whether skin and brain and heart cells have the same genes. That was a fundamental question at the time, and that is what the early experiments were done to try to find out the answer to that question. I say that current interest has moved from that question to whether we can use the replacement of aged and diseased cells to help human health. And this is the direction of the talk that I will now give. The pioneers in this field were two Americans, Robert Briggs and Thomas King, and they did their fundamental work in the 1950s. And this showed that it is possible to transplant the nucleus of one cell into the egg of another so that the nucleus gives the fundamental information to the egg. And this was the design of the experiment to tell us whether all cells have the same genes. For example, if it is possible to take the nucleus of one kind of cell and put it into an egg, which has no genes of its own, and you can then get a normal organism that must mean that the nucleus came from a cell which had a complete set of genes. My own graduate work was done under Michael Fishberg, and he uh, persuaded me to do the work on another kind of frog. And he made one fundamental discovery. This was a genetic marker because if you do those experiments, you do need to have a genetic marker for the nucleus that you transplant. None was known at the time, and he had a, another graduate student who had a, an unexplained result. The effect of this what he, was that he discovered a mutation which removed ribosomal genes and ribosomal genes make one nucleolus. You can see to the left that the nuclei have a single black spot. This is made by the ribosomal genes, whereas in the, on the right-hand side, you can see two nucleolus wild-type cells, and most of them have two such nucleoli. This turned out to be an extremely useful genetic marker, and facilitated the experiments, giving an, an, giving an answer to the question of all cells, whether all cells have the same gene. The other technical problem, we had several technical problems, was to make a needle with a glass rod so that it can be used to inject into an egg without causing damage. And we had to make, in those days, an instrument that did this. And you can see this needle with an air bubble marker has an extremely sharp point, rather like the sting of a wasp or other insect. And that is so sharp that you can inject it into an egg without damaging the egg. That was a requirement and that made possible these experiments. The next problem was that these eggs are covered with an extremely elastic jelly, 
which is marked by the white spots round this egg, and this makes it impossible to inject something into that egg without pulling the jelly right through the egg to the other side. <clears throat> we discovered an, uh, an ultraviolet irradiation source which uh, removed the jelly and made possible the actual experiment so that you could inject the nucleus of a cell into an egg without causing damage. So now we turn uh, to what has happened in the last several decades and tell you the evidence that when you do a nuclear transplant, you can in fact reprogram the genetic activity of a cell nucleus. This was the first adult animal made by nuclear transfer as long ago as 1958, and it was an example of a cloned animal which had not been made at that point. And this frog was an entirely normal animal, uh, and it lived for 20 years and made many thousands of offspring. This came from a specialized embryo cell and it was the first indication that if you take the nucleus from a specialized cell, that nucleus can cause the formation of a complete organism, complete adult animal. This was followed by doing the same experiment using a muscle cell. This muscle cell has a striated uh, material going right through the cell that's actually a muscle fiber and the blue spot in the middle is the nucleus of that cell. If you transplant that nucleus into an egg, like I've indicated, you can at first get only dead eggs. This is an egg which is abnormal on one side, the lower left, and on the top right are some normal cells. That embryo dies within a day. But if you take some of the cells from the top right and do another nuclear transplant from them to another set of eggs, these eggs can now develop more or less normally. And this is an example of two tadpoles derived either from a fertilized egg or from the nucleus of the muscle cell on the, on the right, as I look at it. And if you look at the eye of the tadpole, which was derived from the muscle cell nucleus, it's an entirely normal eye with lens, retinal layers, pigmented iris, all those thousands of cells make a normal eye. But all of these cells have a nucleus, which is the direct derivative product of the nucleus from the muscle cell. That demonstrates the point that the muscle cell nucleus even though it has guided the formation of a muscle cell, nevertheless has all the genes necessary to make all these kinds of eye cells. And indeed, it can make a normal adult fertile animal. That was the early evidence that when you do nuclear transfer, that is putting the body cell nucleus into an egg, the egg can reprogram that nucleus so that it now behaves like a normal embryo nucleus and makes all these different kinds of cells. The <coughs> result of this <coughs> uh, kind of work gave us an, a concept of how this is happening. Remember that an egg is designed to transform sperm to an embryo-active nucleus. 
whereas on the right, the nucleus is designed in most cells to carry out the same pattern of gene expression. So in a muscle cell, the muscle nucleus is expecting to only form, express muscle genes and to make a muscle cell. Now what happens is that the components of the egg, which include those yellow and blue substances that I referred to, try to have the same effect on the transplanted nucleus, like the muscle nucleus. On the other hand, the muscle nucleus tries to resist any change, and so the result is that sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. So the main point of that early experiment was that you can reprogram the nucleus of a specialized cell so that it is made to go back and behave like a normal embryo cell. So reaching the conclusions from these early experiments, they are these. It says nearly all cells in the body have a complete genome. That means that all kinds of genes are present in these cells, even if they are specialized cells. The second conclusion was that egg cytoplasm has a remarkable ability to reprogram gene expression back to an embryonic state. And the third conclusion is that as cells differentiate, their nuclei become increasingly resistant to reprogramming by eggs. More recently, this same experiment has been done by a previous colleague of mine to show that the principles can also apply to monkeys and as far as is permitted to humans. Looking at the diagram to the top left, he took skin of a monkey and transplanted the skin cell nucleus into the egg. The egg, I should say, has its own genes or chromosomes taken away, and the donor of the egg on the top right uh, was used to transplant the skin cell nucleus into that egg. The egg then divides, as it does in the frog experiments, to make an embryo. He then took the cells from the inner part of the embryo which are the cells which will normally give rise in mammals to the embryo, and put them into culture. And these give rise to the so-called embryonic stem cells. This was a great discovery of a previous colleague of mine, Martin Evans, and he quite rightly got his Nobel Prize for that in to a Six, um, for, the, for the discovery of embryonic stem cells. These cells are extremely important because they go on dividing in culture in the laboratory, but at any time you can make them differentiate into kind of cells you might want. And the diagram shows that the stem cell creation is followed by increase in cell number. It then says you add factors. Now factors are products of genes which are used throughout development to make cells specialize in different ways. And these are substances that are known to make cells turn into heart or brain or skin or anything else and he added factors to make these cells derived from the skin turn into heart cells. And I hope this video will work. Yes, now you can see <coughs> a sheet of beating cells 
These are cardiomyocytes, muscle cells, um, but they are derived, in this case, from the monkey skin, and they uh, beat in, in, with a good rhythm, and they look very much like normal heart muscle cells. So it illustrated the general point, which was that you can do these kind of experiments uh, <coughs> with <coughs> monkeys and also with humans now to make specialized cells from the skin. And this is the direction in which, in which work is now progressing. The idea is that if you can take a small piece of skin from a human or other animal, usually a piece about one millimeter, a tiny piece of skin, which would contain uh, tens of thousands of cells, you can use these to make these embryonic stem cells and hence derive uh, beating heart cells from the skin. That's really the background to this area of work. I think we've seen that. So now we turn to the next part of my talk and this asks two questions. What are the components of eggs and the progenitors, the oocytes, that can reprogram somatic cell nuclei? That's one question. What are the components that have these remarkable effects? The second question asks, I can't understand that. No battery. No battery. Mm. No battery. <laughs> I see. That's in my bag. Um, uh, <laughs> no battery. We can. Uh, I'll go and get that. So far. So, this second question uh, is to un ask what is the cause of resistance of somatic cell? nuclei, body nuclei, to the egg reprogramming factors. Uh, you might say, who, why do we mind about that? Why should we want to know? The general rule is that in scientific advances, the first phase is to find the answer to a question. And the second phase to, uh, is to understand how things work. It usually is, if you understand a mechanism, you can find an enormous number of other applications of, what, of the work you are doing. So that's just to recap. These are the two key questions which uh, have given scientists a lot of work to do in the last several decades. So I'm now going to talk, say something about the mechanism of this remarkable reprogramming by eggs on the transplanted somatic nuclei. And one such phenomenon is called epigenetic memory. This phenomenon only became clear in the last few years, but it is now evident that cells and their nuclei carry a memory of what they were before the experimental transplantation. And to go back a step, it means that muscle nuclei, though they can be reprogrammed, they remember in some way that they came from a muscle cell. This is an important point because it limits the success of the nuclear transplant reprogramming process. So <clears throat> we must first understand what we mean by epigenetic memory. <clears throat> and we need to ask uh, whether epigenetic memory helps to stabilize gene expression and accounts for resistance of transplanted nuclei. <clears throat> 
I mentioned that there is this resistance. The nuclei do not like to change, and sometimes they can be made to change by the egg cytoplasm, other kind of times they do not. So in this experiment, the next, the third line says, we're looking at endoderm-specific genes. That means those genes that are strongly expressed in the endoderm of the embryo, shown in light blue on the left, and underneath that it says donor endoderm cells, and the big bar up to high means that the endoderm cells, that's the cells of the endoderm part of the embryo, which is due to become intestine, is strongly, the, these expression is strong. So the endoderm specific gene in blue is strongly expressed in that part of the embryo. By comparison, if you look at the other end of the embryo, the fertilized egg ectoderm cells in the middle column, that gene is hardly expressed at all. It's switched off in the non-endoderm cells, and that's what happens in normal development. Over to the right, we have nuclear transplant ectoderm. That's the part of the embryo which should not express the endoderm genes, and that shows a high bar in red, and it means that this endoderm gene is strongly expressed in the wrong cell type, in the cells that should not form endoderm. That is the, that's the phenomenon of memory, and it means that the nuclei, though they are transplanted, remember, at least for some genes, where they came from. Now, I need to explain that when you do these experiments, the first thing that happens is that the egg makes the transplanted nucleus divide many times, about 10 times, and there is no gene transcription at that time. So the transplanted muscle nucleus is made to divide 10 times, so it goes from uh, the, the first stage, 10 divisions makes 1,000 cells, and those cells are sometimes switched into embryonic stem cells, but other times they remember that they came from the donor cell and they continue to express the wrong genes in the wrong cell type. And this phenomenon is, affects quite a large number of genes. So in this diagram, you can see that what was done here was to transplant uh, nuclei from uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts and uh, at rate from, from cells that are not appropriate. And you can see that some 400 genes were overexpressed when they should not be, and about 500 genes were underexpressed where they should not be. So this is a measure of the uh, memory of a nucleus of its previous life in a body cell. So the, uh, this states the main facts. The top bit says the active state of gene expression of memory on genes is propagated through cell, 12 cell divisions with no gene transcription. So the nucleus remembers where it came from even though it's not transcribing genes at that point. But when it starts to describe, to transcribe them later, this memory shows up. And the second main conclusion from these experiments is that there is a methylation of the donor cell nucleus. It's the histone 3 lysine 4 methylation in the donor cell. And this methylation, this epigenetic mark, is very important in preserving the memory. And indeed, as you will see, if you remove that epigenetic mark, this can, to a large extent, remove, take away the memory. <laughs>
and this is now a result of the experiments. I'll show whether this can be seen or well, I can't see it anyway, but I'll try and describe it. If you look at the top bar where it says fertilized egg, the light blue spots show you that when you look at the development of cells from a fertilized egg, something like 95% give rise to normal development and they show complete uh, reversal of any memory. The bright blue line underneath is called nuclear transplant blastula from embryo cells. They do quite well, but they, it's something like 80% success in removing the memory, in developing normally, removing memory. And then at the very bottom, there is the purple spots called nuclear transplant neurula. That's a later stage when the cells are already beginning to form different kinds of structure. And you can see that the success rate, when that is the proportion which form feeding tadpole, is down to about 50%. Now, my colleague was able to carry out demethylation uh, of the neuralar cells, and this one is shown in red, and you can use various substances, or to be exact, the messenger RNA encoding substances which demethylate histones. And this was successful in demethylating the H3K4 methylation of the donor nuclei. And that now, remarkably, gives a great improvement in the success of the nuclear transplant survival. So that's the red line, which is called nuclear transplant neuralar demethylation. And this is one of the first cases where we know what the basis is of memory. This is the memory that prevents the nucleus of a specialized cell being fully reprogrammed back to an embryonic state. And this is a lot of current work is going in this direction to try to find out what are the epigenetic modifications which enable a somatic cell to remember where it came from and to find a way of removing this memory so that as a result of these experiments the uh, embryos you get and the cells derived are more normal. So now we want to analyze further what are the mechanisms by which eggs will carry out reprogramming. And for this purpose, we have to use a different kind of cell. The top part of this diagram shows says two kinds of nuclear transfer in amphibia. And the top bit, called egg, shows that there is a red bar with about 10 rapid cell divisions. So as the somatic nucleus is transplanted and it forms the early embryo blastula, that is when the transplanted nucleus has not made any gene products. It's not been transcribed. The green part means that later on in development it starts to be transcribed and you can get the normal cloned frog that we referred to before. Now, the important point is that in the first part, where there are these red bars, meaning multiple DNA replication, it is common for the replication to be imperfect because the somatic cell does not expect to have to divide very rapidly many times. And when it does that, it tends to lose chromosomes and the nuclei become abnormal. Looking now at the bottom part of the diagram, it says oocyte. The oocyte is the progenitor of the egg, and it shows a diagram of somatic nuclei being transplanted into the very specialized nucleus of that oocyte. This is called germinal vesicle. And when you do that, there is no replication. The green bar means immediately 
that the transplanted nuclei start to transcribe genes, and on the right it says new gene expression, and when you do this, you find that the transplanted nuclei are very efficiently made to transcribe new genes. So you can do the nuclear reprogramming experiment better in the oocyte than in the egg because it avoids DNA damage. This is the oocyte, a large cell, and the GV, the germinal vesicle or nucleus of the oocyte, is, you cannot see it inside that oocyte, but that's what you inject nuclei into. And this oocyte GV has uh, about a thousand extra chromosomal nucleoli, that is extra chromosomal genes, and these are highly transcribed, and what one can do is to inject genes as plasmid DNA into these oocyte nuclei. When you do that, the graph shows that the differentiated nuclei from embryonic stem cells, these are mammals, uh, are very quickly activated, and you see that it marks SOX2, OCT4, and NANOG. These are the early embryonic genes which are required for the normal reprogramming of cells. The lower part of the picture shows that you, when you do this, you get something like 95% success, and this is much better than you can get if you use eggs. Now, you can do multiple nuclear transfers to oocytes, and we now know something of the mechanisms involved. Uh, this experiment shows the transplantation of donor somatic cell nuclei, which are mostly containing the green linker histone GFP, and you inject them into oocytes in which you have supplied the linker histone marked in red. And we should see the green nuclei very quickly change to red nuclei. This video was uh, taken over the first two hours after nuclear transfer, and you can see that the oocyte has a large store of this linker histone, which replaces the histone of somatic cells, except in two particular cases, the, the one shown in green, where we happened not to break the cell wall of the donor cell, and they do not undergo the exchange. But the, <clears throat> the, this kind of work can be carried out, and we now have some idea of the various modifications which are necessary for this experiment to work. You see a list of these things, DNA demethylation, histone H2A deubiquitination, and so on. And over on the right, it shows that the combination of three different histone modifications is able to greatly improve the uh, gene expression of transplanted nuclei. So it isn't as if one process is necessary. As often happens in development, there are several processes which lead to the same result. And to improve the success rate of nuclear transfer, we have to use all these different processes. I'll pass on that one. And so in summary, you can see that the time course of transcriptional activation <coughs> happens in about 24 hours with these linker histone exchanges, chromatin methylation, actin polymerization, and finally transcription. And this can be seen as the <coughs> closed chromatin with two nucleosomes being opened up by histone B4 and then replaced by histone A3.3, and finally the RNA polymerase comes and reads the genes. So now we switch completely from amphibian work to the famous experiments of Yamanaka and Takahashi. And uh, they uh, happily got their Nobel Prize, or Yamanaka did, in 2012 for this great discovery of reprogramming by an entirely different process. What they found was, uh, I think I'll have to 
direct you across this diagram. If you start with mouse skin, separate the cells into a tube, and then you add genes as DNA, the gene transfer genes were SOX2, OCT4, KOLA4, and MYC, and occasionally one of those cells, shown under the diagram called cell with new genes, switches. It takes up these genes and flips, surprisingly, into an embryonic stem cell state. This is quite rare, happens probably in only one in 10,000 cells, but it works. You've now got one cell which has been made to express these key pluripotency genes, SOX, OCT, KOLA4MIC, and this gene, this cell, can be expanded into the <coughs> embryonic cells, shown in red, <coughs> and these can be switched, as I mentioned before, by factors into, for example, a nerve cell, and so you can transplant the switched cells into a host uh, under the name of transplant. It's a complicated process, and that this summarizes it, but we don't need the details. And <clears throat> more recently, people have been very successful in deriving nerve cells by this procedure, uh, particularly the lab of Wernig. And you can see her some nerve cells derived from embryo, mouse embryo fibroblasts by this procedure. The procedure is particularly important because it can be done with human cells. The frog experiments, which started this field off, um, on a, those same experiments cannot be done with humans because women do not like to give their eggs for this work. And so by doing this gene transfer to cultured cells, you bypass the need to use germline cells, oocytes or eggs, and this has had an enormous effect uh, all around the world. You find there are institutes using this procedure to create nerve cells or other specialized cells uh, from uh, any cell you like to take. So the procedure works at this extremely low efficiency, but it does work with skin cells, bone marrow cells, uh, fibroblasts, all sorts of cells. It's been an extremely important advance, and uh, this is the way most of the field is now going. The question is, does this really work? And the, the difficulty is that when you derive these specialized cells, like the nerve cells shown, they look like nerve cells, but they are not completely correct. They mostly do not undergo the very last stage of switching. So these cells, and the same are true of other cell types, they go 90% of the way to forming functional nerve cells or any other kind of cell, but there's still one stage missing, and that still has to be worked out by the various laboratories which are in this field. And I'll pass that one. So looking at a summary, we've shown that you can start with adult skin, top right, transplant nuclei to oocytes and eggs, and directly get macrophage lymphocyte and all these cells. The lower part of the diagram goes from an early embryo of the Yamanaka procedure to embryonic stem cells and then directly to the blood cells, the pancreas cells, and heart. And this is the route which is now being very extensively used and looks the most hopeful for cell replacement. So now the last part of the talk I will switch to asking what is the prospect for cell replacement therapy. Can we actually hope that you can take skin cells or other cells from a human and turn them into cells which will be useful to patients to relieve whatever their cells do not do? And I'm going to quote the work on eye cells because this is the most advanced part of this whole uh, procedure and I shall refer to the human disorder called macular 
degeneration, and older people often have this problem, and uh, the work I'm quoting, by the way, is that of Peter Coffey and Lyndon Dark Cruz in London, who are the most advanced in this area. And when you have this macular degeneration, it starts by your central vision being non-functional. So you can see that uh, a view of Big Ben, you can see the clock. With macular dysfunction, you can't see the center of, your, of what you're looking at at all. You just can't see that. You have some remaining peripheral vision, um, and eventually that disappears too. So the outcome is blindness, and this is a very major problem for uh, people who suffer macular degeneration. The way this works is that in this top part of the diagram, you see that the rods and cones of photoreceptor cells connect directly with the retinal pigmented epithelium shown in brown. And these, this retinal pigmented epithelium secures the good function of rods and cones in the photoreceptor cells. Now, when you have the degeneration problem, the retinal pigmented epithelium disappears, de degenerates, and as a result, the rods and cones of the photoreceptor cells also cease to function. That's, so what you have to do is find a way of replacing the retinal pigmented epithelium. And this has been done using the Yamanaka procedure to generate uh, a large layer of cells. As you see, it's about a three by six millimeter patch of plastic, actually, with cells attached to it. And these, this is a monolayer of retinal pigmented cells. And this piece of tissue can be grafted into the back of the eye of patients. You need considerable skill for this. And Lyndon Doc Cruz, who I showed before, is a great expert at that. And he can undertake this with about the same amount of surgery as is required for cataract lens replacement. So uh, this has been done now on animals. And they've done a few human tests, uh, because everything has to be tested on humans before governments will permit patients to receive these treatments. You need to know that this procedure with the eye is critically dependent on the small cell number needed. So here you see that the 10 to the 13 cells of a human, 10 to the 11 for the heart, and the retinal pigmented epithelium of the eye has only about 50,000 cells. So it's a very good cell type to use for this. It's a single cell type, and you don't need so many cells. So well, the question people ask is, why can't we have this treatment now? The fact is you can't, at least in, 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 in any European country. And the problem is that surgical treatment needs approval by regulatory bodies, committees. And regulatory bodies are extremely conservative. Um, the, the, they do this because they're afraid that lawyers will award massive compensation to anyone who has this procedure and is not happy with it. The lawyers are able to award millions of pounds to someone who has this procedure and, and claims that it doesn't work as well as they thought. So the hospitals, surgeons, the whole medical profession is extremely worried about this threat of the governments, of the committees, so they do not like to undertake the process until it has had extensive testing. And the people like Lyndon R. Cruz and Peter Coffey consider it will take another four years by the time the human tests have been completed. So far, the human tests look very encouraging, but it takes a long time to carry out the necessary tests that these regulatory committees actually require. You could say, well, that can be solved 
by a patient uh, giving what's called informed consent. And the problem is that the lawyers do not accept that an ordinary individual like you or me is qualified to give informed consent. They say we're too stupid to understand what the procedure is and so we've given consent without being informed. I find that very annoying um, and so we're stuck with this threat of compensation blocking the use of this procedure. And uh, in four years, time, four years, a lot of people go blind. So it's a, it's a great tragedy. So that's where we are. Um, and of course, the last question you will ask is, who decides whether a patient may be given these stem cells? Who make the decisions? Is it lawyers, priests, politicians, or even patients? I would hope that eventually it will be patients who take the decision and they make what I would be sure is an informed consent and that would open up this cell replacement field enormously to a lot of people who could benefit from it. Now the chance of this procedure working for the main nervous system, the brain, is much less because the brain consists of large numbers of different kinds of cells, and you, you, it, whereas the eye, you only need one kind of cell. And the problem of getting the implanted cells to function correctly is not yet solved. You would have to inject large numbers of, of manufactured neural cells, nerve cells, into the brain and hope that they find the right place. These experiments are just beginning to be done and it is possible that cells will work, at least some of them, and that eventually this whole procedure could be extended to use uh, for the, the brain and the nervous system. Um, the, the future, I would say, that is of the whole cell replacement field. And so let me summarize the talk now. Um, the first point I made was that nearly all cells of the body have the same set of genes. That's where we started. And remember that if they did not, this whole prospect of cell replacement would not exist. So it's lucky that that is in fact the case. That opens up the future, in my view, of the cell replacement field. Um, we now understand, to take the second point, that nuclear transfer and the Yamanaka procedure uh, begins to tell us why this happens, how we can try to make the procedure work better. And the Yamanaka procedure is extremely inefficient but immensely useful. And if we could improve the efficiency of that, it will be much easier to grow the large number of cells you need for something like the brain or nervous system than you do for the eye. And my final view is that the cell replacement therapy has good prospects for small cell numbers and single cell types. The prospects are, I think, will first be shown in eye replacement therapy. And I show my colleagues who've done the necessary part of my work and my own background, various bodies have supported the work. The end. Thank you.